Of all the artifacts ever created by humankind, there is one that stands out head and shoulders above all others. This remarkable creation has graced the courts of kings and queens. It went to the far corners of the earth and it was there when new lands were explored. It helped to create the most beautiful literature on the planet and it formed part of the most moving orations ever delivered. It went to war with millions of men and witnessed the inauguration of presidents. It's been the inspiration for hundreds of hymns, oratorios and pop songs. This 400-year-old part of human culture has touched the lives of millions of people and was even there when humans first explored the lunar surface. This unique artifact is the King James Bible. The King James Bible is the Bible which um, changed the world. The King James Bible is a truly remarkable book and it was first published in England in 1611 and in the past 400 years it's played an enormous role in human history. It's also been a huge bestseller. More King James Bibles have been sold over the last four centuries than of any other book in the history of humanity. It's estimated that one billion copies of this book have been produced and its influence has been immense. The King James Bible actually was the, the, in many ways the creme de la creme of the English Renaissance. The King James Bible became the most widely read and most widely distributed English Bible in the world, but it was not the first English Bible ever produced. There were a few very early translations of parts of the Bible into Old English in the medieval period, like the Lindisfarne Gospels, which dates back to the late 7th century. 600 years later, in 1384, John Wycliffe produced a Bible in Middle English. Then a man called William Tyndale came along. He was sympathetic to the Reformation in Europe and wanted to make the Bible available in everyday English. The Catholic Church at the time didn't like the idea. Tyndale really is possibly the, the, the central figure when it comes to translating the Bible into English. Um, he never got to finish his translation because uh, uh, he was uh, persecuted really uh, by the established or institution of the church at the time for translating the Bible into English. He eventually fled to Germany. But they tracked him down and brought him back and he was burnt at the stake. But his dying prayers recorded as uh, before he died was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Reverend Dirk Heerfus is the head of the KwaZulu-Natal region of the Bible Society of South Africa. He has a keen interest in the history of the King James Bible. Dirk says the unfortunate Tyndale lost his life in the crossfire between the Catholic Church and the spreading Protestant Reformation. Then the notorious King Henry VIII became King of England. He broke from the Catholic Church and formed the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And it wasn't long after that that Henry VIII commissioned what was called the Great Bible, um, another in the succession of English Bibles. And then came about uh, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, which dated back, well, which really linked back to Geneva and Switzerland with Calvin's whole uh, movement there. Um, so there were these different Bibles that were in existence. Later, when Henry's daughter Elizabeth became queen in 1558, there were these two major English Bible translations in circulation. The Bishop's Bible was the official church Bible, and the Geneva Bible was preferred by staunch Calvinists, also known as Puritans. When she died in 1603, her nephew, James of Scotland, also became King of England. He had been King in Scotland since he was 13 months old. When he travelled down to England for his coronation, he was met by numerous interest groups who wanted to petition him on important matters. Among them were religious groups as well. Of course he was met by all these different groups. The Church of England was at that stage about 40 years old, governed by the bishops. But within the Church of England there was a group called the Puritans, who really... Uh, wanted to bring in a far more strict and precise way some of the implications of the Reformation into the Church of England. And the bishops and the Puritans uh, were at odds with one another. The Bible that was used in the Church of England at the time was the Bishop's Bible, the so-called Bishop's Bible, which uh, was, came about during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. 
And then the, the Puritans, they used the Geneva Bible. In a sense, the English Bible had become polarized between these two groups. So you have this Anglican Puritan group. You have another group that really hoped that King James might become more Catholic. And so those different factions are competing for the heart and mind of the king and for the control of the country itself. Dr. Diana Severance is the curator of the Dunham Bible Museum at the Houston Baptist University in Texas. The museum designed and held a special exhibition to commemorate the 400th anniversary. It was but one of many exhibitions and events held worldwide in 2011. A number of films also celebrated the anniversary. Diana says King James himself didn't like the Geneva Bible because of some explanatory notes. But there were some notes in the Geneva Bible that were very unfortunate. And King James, when he was king of Scotland, as a boy in Scotland, when he was raised, he was reading this Geneva Bible. And all of the notes, any time it mentions the word king in the note, it doesn't have king, it has tyrant. And every time King James reads that, he feels like it's an assault on his kingship. So he did not like the Geneva Bible at all. James was an astute politician and tried to unite the various religious groups. He called what uh, was called the Hampton Court Conference in Hampton Court. It began in January 1604 where he, he presided and first of all he allowed the bishops to put their point across and then he allowed the Puritans to put their point across. And both sides I think were expecting to, to win him to get him onto their side. But he, King James was very well educated. He was educated in the classics. He was thoroughly educated in scripture. His knowledge of the Bible was probably better than most of the, the church leaders at the time. And he was very conscious that he as the King of England was the head of the Church of England, the titular head of the Church of England. And he was, he was adamant that he was going to assume that position and that they should all understand that. And that he wouldn't really yield to any group. He would establish himself as the as the middle ground and so the, he made it very clear to the bishops that thorough reform was, ne was needed in the Church of England. Uh, the Puritans came with, with many different points which he, he didn't accede to any of them but the one thing that came out of the Hampton Court Conference was a proposal for a new English translation of the Bible and King James latched on to this. He thought, King James, thought a, a good translation, a new translation was be good because he said, I've never seen a good translation, especially the Geneva one, which is the worst of all because of its notes. So he agreed to have a new translation and it was going to be done with a committee. He had the rules all set out. And one of the stipulations was there would be no notes in this new Bible that was issued. And part of the goal is to ameliorate the differences between the different factions that had grown up in England. The interesting thing about the way the King James Bible was produced was that it was the work of a large committee. We don't know exactly how many translators were active at any time because the lists of translators vary, but we're talking about 50 people organized in six uh, committees or companies as they were called, two based in Oxford, two in Cambridge and two in Westminster. And each company was allocated a different part of the Bible. So you'd have one company doing the prophets, another doing the Pentateuch, another doing the Gospels and so forth. The translators were uh, nearly all ecclesiastics. They were nearly all members of the clergy. Many of them were also academics. Uh, nearly all of them were either experts in Hebrew or in Greek literature or both. They were trained and seasoned biblical scholars. The only strange thing about the translation committees is that the best Hebrew and Semitic language scholar in England was a man called Hugh Broughton. And he was not allowed to be a translator because he was so cantankerous and difficult that everybody knew that no one could work with him. And so Hugh Broughton was excluded from the translation enterprise and in fact wrote a very rude and angry pamphlet when it appeared saying how badly it had all been done. Dr. Ewan Cameron is professor of Reformation Church History at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. We met him at a King James Bible exhibition organized by the Museum of Biblical Art and the American Bible Society. 
It was in this hall in Hampton Court near London that King James in all probability held a conference with the various religious parties and issued the decree for the new translation of the Bible in 1604. The translators worked on the new translation for seven years. It was completed in 1611 and presented to King James. He was very pleased with it. Of course, he, he insisted that he would have the final say. So, so basically all of the, you know, the work ultimately had to come through him at the end of the day and receive his seal of approval. This Bible came to be known as the King James Bible or the authorized version because it was authorized by the king. But this Bible wasn't popular right from the start. There's not as much evidence of the immediate reaction to the King James Bible as we might think in the light of the fame that it subsequently achieved. They didn't hold any big sort of ceremonial occasions, they didn't have a public launch, they didn't have a book party for it. Um, it was really done very quietly. Hugh Broughton, the man who had been excluded from the translation teams, writes a sort of angry denunciation of how terribly this work's been done and it should all be redone. Um, on the whole, it takes quite a long time for the book to establish itself. Largely, probably because of the expense. People were not going, if they had a Bible, they weren't going to go and, you know, buy another expensive book, which is what the Bible was at that time. And largely because people adhered to their historical positions. I mean, the, the, the pilgrims, for example, when they went on the Mayflower to New Plymouth, they took the Geneva Bible with them. But it wasn't long after that that the King James Bible came, probably from about 50 years after uh, it, the translation was completed, it began to be acknowledged and accepted as the standard English Bible. And it certainly, within 100 years, had become the standard English Bible. Yes, for a long time, the King James Bible didn't make much impact. The Geneva Bible it was much used. Geneva Bible was the, was the Bible of, of Shakespeare, for example. But right through uh, the middle part of the 17th century, um, King James was not as, as widely used as, as it might, might have been. It was only after 1660, after the Commonwealth, the Civil War in the Commonwealth, when the restoration of the monarchy, that King James Bible came into its own as the uni uniting translation for the churches. In time, this translation became the most successful publication in the history of humankind. When the King James Bible was published in 1611, nobody could predict that this would be the most successful Bible translation ever. At the time, the printing press had been around for less than 150 years. Johannes Gutenberg revolutionized printing when he introduced movable type. This meant that books could now, for the first time, be produced in large quantities. Before that time, all books had to be written by hand. But even with the advent of the printing press, it was still extremely tedious and expensive to print anything. Paper was expensive and letters had to be handcrafted from metal. A mold was then made of each letter and molten lead was poured into it to create a single letter. Then typesetters would set the letters one by one to form words and sentences. Printing took time because everything was done manually. Uh, let's imagine the typesetter setting the type, one piece of type, one at a time. And the actual printer who would pull the lever and print one side of a sheet at a time. Dr. Liana Lupas is the curator of the scripture collection at the American Bible Society and helped to design and organize the King James Bible exhibition in the Museum of Biblical Art in New York, where they have an enormous collection of Bibles. This is the first edition of the King James Bible, which came off the Royal Printing Press in 1611. It clearly states that this version is authorized by the king. Because printing material was so expensive, the letters were used over and over for various printing jobs. This meant that when a new edition or new imprint of a book or a Bible became necessary, it had to be set all over by hand again. Consequently, early printed Bibles had many printing mistakes. Some of these mistakes were even intentional. Oh, the wicked Bible. Um, well, 
in order to print the Bible, you had to have a license from the king. And Robert Barker had the license to, to print, and there was another printer who was liking the job. And so he thought by getting Robert Barker into trouble, he might be able to get the license. So the story goes that he got a saboteur into Robert Barker's office and um, made a mistake in the Ten Commandments. He left out three letters. So in Exodus 20, verse 14, it says, Thou shalt commit adultery. He left out the knot. This Bible became known as the Wicked Bible, and there are only 11 of them in existence today. This is because the entire edition was recalled, the printers were fined the equivalent of 200,000 rands, and lost the printing contract. There's a whole list of errors in Bibles. Another Bible that we have is um, called the Vinegar Bible. And you, it's a beautifully printed Bible, large folio Bible, but at the heading of one of the pages where it should say Parable of the Vineyard, it says Parable of the Vinegar. And you could see how you left out a D and a Y and a G is easily confused. Um, so it's the Vinegar Bible. However, the King James Bible translation was based on solid scholarship. If you read the title page of the original King James Bible in 1611, it says, translated out of the original tongues, that would be Hebrew and Greek, and with the former translations diligently compared and revised, and appointed to be read in churches. So, the translators, they used the existing English translations as recommended by the king, and specifically the bishop's Bible. But they used the Hebrew text and the Greek text in the best editions available at the time. They are uh, very conscious of trying to stick closely to the text. So the King James Bible becomes very good, for example, for somebody learning New Testament Greek because the, uh, the translation is close to the Greek. Uh, and uh, a good illustration is that where they need to slightly expand the sense to give the sense of the Greek, but not the Greek itself, they'll put it in italics. So italics, you see uh, every so often a little uh, word or a f small phrase in italics because that brings out the sense of the Greek, although it's not a literal translation of the Greek as such. But why was this translation so successful? I think those who appreciate form um, and structure in language will appreciate the King James Bible. And those who like the form and structure to equate or, or to, to, to parallel the meaning will like the, the King James Bible. Those who want simply to get to the meaning as, as simply and, and easily as possible um, may prefer uh, not to read the King James Bible. It's also to do with one's background. The King James Bible is easy to memorize, very interestingly, and perhaps because it's translated with a view to being read aloud. So it's actually easier to memorize than some of the modern translations. The King James Bible also became so successful because it was not informed by a specific theological stance. It also didn't have the marginal notes like that of the Geneva Bible, which irritated King James so much. The King James Bible was published with minimal marginal notes of a technical character. The instructions provided by the King for the translator specifically indicated that there should be no marginal notes and by that the, it was understood no elaborate notes on religious issues. The letter type used in the King James Bible was that of Middle English where for example the letter S looks more like a modern F. As uh, the King James continued to be printed and reprinted some sort of changes to the text had to be made. First of all, in 1611 it was printed in uh, what is called black letter or gothic type. Already by the end of the 18th century everything was being printed in Roman type. So there was a need to transcribe, to transpose it from one form of lettering to the other. As English developed, the typesetting of letters changed and the language also varied here and there. 
Uh, already by the time the King James Bible was translated, certain of the forms that are used were, were beginning to, to fall away. Uh, for example, the, uh, if, if one would add, uh, keepeth instead of keeps, um, and, and the these and the thous instead of the use, that was beginning to change already. The King James Bible was produced in folio format, that is, large pages. It wasn't initially as we have Bibles today, you know, sort of available, easily available, commonly available for the common man to purchase because it was expensive. So its, it's, it's main purpose at that stage was to be read in the churches. So the, these larger, what we would call today, pulpit Bibles were printed and they were chained to the pulpits because they were so expensive, otherwise they would be stolen. People would think that a chain is a symbol of captivity, of course, but in fact, when it comes to chain the Bible, that was the method, to the only way to make them available to everybody. They were placed in a church and chained to a pulpit or to a pillar or to a pew because they were too expensive to, for the church to run the risk of losing them. But the, the main purpose was to make the Bible available. However, very soon smaller copies were also published, which were cheaper. Because of the expense, publishers also allowed the public to buy the Bible in installments. Well, we had um, printing Bibles and buying them were expensive. So you could subscribe to a Bible and you would get part of it in paper wrappers every month. And after two years, you would have the entire Bible. Then you could take it to the binder and he would bind it for you. He would, then you can make some choices. You might want to add a concordance. You might want to add some maps or different illustrations to the basic scripture itself. So quite a few of the early American Bibles are subscription Bibles. After the reign of King James, there was a period of instability in Britain, which eventually led to the English Civil War. When the monarchy was restored in 1660, it also cemented the position of the King James Bible, which became the only official English Bible. After the Civil War in England, um, the King James Bible does become much more accepted, and it becomes the, the national Bible, the Bible of the people. And so the supreme reign of the King James Bible began. From the middle of the 17th century to the middle of the 20th century, the King James Bible was the, virtually the only Bible for English-speaking peoples. Little wonder the King James Version had such a huge influence worldwide. The King James Bible is a truly remarkable book. More copies of this translation of the Bible have been printed and distributed worldwide than any other Bible translation. Literally hundreds of millions of copies were produced over the last 400 years. It's been a worldwide bestseller for four centuries. The enormous popularity of the King James Bible also ensured that it went places, more places than any other book in history. It first found its way into the homes of ordinary English speakers in Great Britain, but in time it spread around the world. The fact that Britain was a world colonial and naval power played a huge role in this. When the empire spread, the Bible followed, and the Bible of the empire was the King James Bible. In many countries where British sailors went, um, or people went to live in Africa, in some of the Pacific Islands, all over where the British Empire, China, India, the Bible went. Mims Turley is the communications head at the Bible Society of South Africa. Together with the National Library in Cape Town, they put on a King James Bible exhibition. Reverend Gerrit Kritzinger is the CEO of the Bible Society of South Africa and agrees that the British Empire was one of the factors responsible for the widespread of the King James Bible. In those times, the Bible of the day was the King James Bible. So as the people spread throughout the world uh, from England, 
they took the King James Bible with them, and that happened in our own country. Uh, the King James Bible came with the British settlers in 1820. The fact that the King James Bible was the Bible on all Navy ships meant that the Bible was taken everywhere. It even journeyed around the world with Captain Cook. Dr. Phil Towner is the Dean of the NIDA Institute for Biblical Scholarship at the American Bible Society and says that the King James Bible also crossed the Atlantic with the colonists. And then it took off. It came across, of course, with the establishment of the USA. Um, and I think uh, as the story is told, as the American experiment begins, uh, a Bible is needed to kind of galvanize uh, the American spirit, if that's the right way to put it, and uh, the King James Bible becomes the, the standard Bible for a long time. During the colonial period, uh, later in the 1700s, the King James Bible is the American Bible. The King James Bible became the center of American religious culture and spread with early settlers throughout the country. With the birth of the Missionary Society, which led to the American Bible Society, millions of copies of the King James Bible also spread around the world. Well, it's traveled very across the seven seas, really. It's traveled to, to all parts of the world. I mean, the, the great missionary expansion of the 19th century, where people started to take to heart taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. There was the language of the King James. It was in the King James, through the King James Bible, that that, that, that happened. And the King James Bible also played a role in South Africa. The Bible exhibition in Cape Town at the National Museum was extremely well attended. Uh, between the National Library and the Bible Society, um, we organized this exhibition. So people, uh, not only from South Africa, but from all over the world, uh, go and have a look at the Bible exhibition. The South African National Library has two very old copies of the King James Bible. The exhibition showcased an original 1611 Bible. This Bible with the copper clasps is also an original King James Bible donated to South Africa by Prince Alfred, Queen Victoria's son, when the National Library was opened. And he came to open the library, but he then brought with him um, a King James Bible, a very beautiful one, as a, a gift to the library. And we can actually say that the first book that was placed on the shelves of this library was the King James Bible. The King James Bible has played a huge role in South Africa. In the Eastern Cape, the Toza word for school and church or Christian became synonymous because, because of the mission schools. Um, and and the, the King James Bible played a big role in that. Um, it has so had an impact in the area of, of education, of health care, um, obviously in terms of the spread of the gospel. And uh, the people of our country have taken it to heart in different ways, um, whether it be through receiving the gospel and in, in, in through the language of the King James and, and then taking concepts that arise out of the King James Bible um, and also, in a sense, indigenizing them um, in, in the African worldview. Uh, so even today, you know, when we translate the Bible, continue with translations into, into Zulu or into Southern Ndebele, um, into our languages. That's the tradition of the King James. And few people know that when the early Fortrekkers moved into the interior, they took along a copy of the King James Bible. There was a King James Bible, of course, presented to the Fortrekkers before they left on their trek up north. So they took the King James Bible with them. In time, the King James Bible literally spread around the world. Wherever English was used as either the main language or the only language, uh, the King James Bible was influential. But the spread of the King James Bible is not only restricted to this planet. The King James Bible has not only found its way all over the world, it has found its way into space as well. When the first astronauts orbited the moon, 
in uh, 1968. This was broadcast on TV, and they said, we have a message for all the people of the earth. And they read from the first 10 verses of Genesis in the King James translation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. That it was good. And divided the light from the darkness. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. The first men on the moon, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, even took the King James to the moon's surface. Later, in 1971, um, a set of microfilm Bibles were brought to the moon and back, kind of as commemoratives. And you can place the entire King James Bible on a one-inch square of microfilm. And you magnify it 200 times and you can read it. So um, Edgar Mitchell, astronaut Mitchell, brought uh, some of these to the moon and brought the back and we have one of them on display. And before they left the moon, astronaut Mitchell also placed his small red King James Bible on the lunar rover. This King James Bible is still there on the moon today. The King James Bible in time became the most popular Bible translation ever produced. It spread across the globe with sailors, soldiers, explorers, immigrants, missionaries and educators. This book has also had an immense impact on many levels. One of the most significant influences was on the English language itself. For centuries it was the language of the King James Bible that people heard and read in church and that they heard and read at home. Inevitably, it became part and parcel of their world and language. There is hardly an English expression that cannot be traced back to the King James Bible. In the quarter centenary uh, celebrations, uh, many people have pointed out just how important uh, the K King James Bible translation has been for the English language. Robert McCrum, for example, points out in an article in the um, English Sunday Observer I quote, as well as selling an estimated one billion copies since 1611, the King James Bible went straight into our literary bloodstream like a life-saving drug. Whenever we put words into someone's mouth or see the writing on the wall or go from strength to strength or eat, drink and be merry or fight the good fight or bemoan the signs of the times or find a fly in the ointment, or use words such as long-suffering, scapegoat, and peacemaker, we are unconsciously quoting the King James Bible. But the King James Bible not only influenced the language of ordinary people, the language of the King James Bible also found its way into the most significant works of world literature. I think it was um, George Bernard Shaw, the playwright, said one of the reasons he didn't have to think about style when he wrote is because he was raised with the King James Bible being read uh, audibly uh, around him. He, he was immersed in it. It was simply a part of life then. Major literary works like John Milton's Paradise Lost and John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress rely heavily on the King James Bible. And in the U.S., authors like Mark Twain and Ernest Hemingway also clearly show the massive influence of the King James Bible on English literary language. But it also had a huge cultural influence. Yes, it's impacted cultures, impacted languages, impacted world history, it's impacted politics. Um, the whole Christian socialist movement in England was, you know, one always relates the labor movement to Marx and Engels. But in fact, in England, it was probably the King James Bible that inspired the labor movement more than did communism. From the principles of the scripture uh, that led to the whole early Christian socialist movement. 
The majority of people in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries didn't have access to many books. However, the one book a large percentage had access to was the King James Bible. And as the main book available, it doubled up as an educational tool as well. Millions of people learned to read and write because the King James Version was available. It changed society and contributed to the emancipation of women. With its availability in many homes, women could also be taught to read and write. As a result, it started to change the place of women in society. The Bible would be um, the most available book. Uh, and therefore, um, if, if women who are keen to learn and so on uh, could uh, only use the Bible, the Bible would be their textbook. This was true wherever the King James Bible and the English culture spread. This book became a powerful educational aid where missionaries used it to teach indigenous populations to read and write. Well, that, that's true in our own country as well. But, but it was certainly true then. And, and, and people who before could never read could suddenly now read. Um, and, and, and just take, for example, women. Who, who began to read because they were reading the Bible. It, 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 uh, and it became the, the chief text of, of literacy, people learning how to read. The King James Bible even had an influence on other translations of the Bible as well. The first uh, language into which the Bible was translated is Tswana, Robert Moffat, and then a bit later with Wookie. Um, and then, of course, the Koza translation, uh, the Wesleyan missionaries uh, down in the Eastern Cape, uh, Apple Yard and others, um, the American Board of Missions and the first Zulu translation. These early trans translators, as they went about translating the Bible, would have had, one could perhaps put it simplistically, three books in front of them. They would have had a Hebrew Old Testament, a Greek New Testament, and the King James Bible. And the King James Bible would have been a reference point for them as they went about their work of translation. And the King James Bible was also a reference point for those who may have criticized those early translations. So there, once again, we have the King James Bible on two sides of the same debate. Uh, but it was very much an important part and played an important role in the first translations of the Bible into the languages of our people. The fact that the Bible was published so widely in English also meant that people could read it, in many cases, for the first time, for themselves, without the interference of the priests or the church. It became a massive aid in the spread of the Reformation and independent thinking. But, as, but actually, one's got to take a step back before even one gets to literacy. Just, if one looks at the, the world at that time, where people did not have access to literature in their own language that they could read. So reading was, was a, a totally unknown world. Um, at the time when Tyndale was translating the Bible into English, it was only available in Latin. Uh, church service would be in Latin. Uh, the only people who could read the Bible and understand it were the priests. So the normal man and woman just had no access to it. They, they, and, and therefore they couldn't question. They had to accept whatever they were told. But from the time that they could read the Bible in their own language, they could begin to interpret the world differently. And they could question what they were told by those in authority. They could question the practices that were prevalent in the church. Martin Luther, at the same time that Tyndale was translating into English, was translating into German. That translation of the Bible into German probably fueled the Reformation more than anything else. And the Reformation changed the face of history because no longer could you have a, an authoritarian control over people's thought. And it's the expressive power of the language of the King James Version that stirred the hearts and souls of men and women over the centuries. When one finds oneself in different conflicts around the world, um, take slavery in the South of America, take colonialism in our own history and context. You get both sides of the conflict drawing inspiration and direction from the same book. Um, and, and, and this has been true and you know just all over the world. Uh, what has been fundamental as a principle uh, in Christ there is neither slave nor free, neither Jew nor Greek, neither male nor female. Now these concepts have played a very 
important role in, um, in defining the struggle for freedom. Now, the same thing happened in the, in the South of America, uh, in the whole move to, to abolish slavery. I mean, spirituals were written where the King James, phrases from the King James were taken into and reworked uh, into the culture there and, and became cries for freedom. Uh, go down Moses. Paul Robeson made it famous. Let my people go, those very words. The language of the King James Bible became the language of, if you like, religion. Uh, the language of faith for the, um, the, uh, uh, the um, African Americans in that context of slavery because it was English, but it was not the English spoken by their masters. They, uh, of course, incorporated that language into, the, into their spiritual music, uh, but they also heard and read, and this was the language of, of, of worship for them. Uh, and, and yet there's that kind of um, subversiveness to it. I mean, the reason they hang on to, hung on to it, and, and still do today in many African American church communities, is, is because it is distinctively a piece of their tradition, became the kind of language through which they could articulate their suffering. In more recent years, um, themes from the King James Bible were very instrumental in the whole freedom struggle, let my people go. The King James Bible would also be used in the abolition addresses of Abraham Lincoln, in the writings of African American authors, and it featured strongly in the famous speeches of the civil rights movement. And so much of our music and hymns reflect the King James Bible. Today, many people don't attend church, but they will come across the King James in one of the most famous pieces of music the world has ever known, Handel's Messiah. This continues to keep the King James Bible alive in the hearts and minds of people. The oratorios bring the language and the inspiration of the Bible to believers and non-believers. The most available book in all libraries is the Bible. Well, the second most available book is Handel's Messiah. And Handel's Messiah, the libretto, the words, are basically mostly the King James translation of the Bible, selections of scriptures from the King James. And uh, that music has carried the King James Bible all over the world. The King James has not only had an impact on formal language and literature, but has also deeply influenced church music through the centuries. Wherever soldiers of the British Empire went to war, from the Redcoats who fought against the Zulus to the soldiers in the South African War and those who fought in the two world wars in the 20th century, the King James Bible accompanied them. This is a Bible that was issued to South African troops who fought on the side of the British during the Second World War. But the King James has also entered popular culture in a major way. It's everywhere in movie titles such as My Brother's Keeper, Chariots of Fire, The Quick and the Dead, and In the Name of the Father. In the popular comic strip Peanuts, the characters frequently quote from the King James Bible. And many popular songs use the King James Bible for their lyrics. Boney M had a huge hit with By the Rivers of Babylon. It was taken word for word from Psalm 137. And the birds popular turn, turn, turn of the 1960s used the words from Ecclesiastes 3 in the King James Bible. There is a time for everything. That the King James Bible has played an immense role the last 400 years is certain. But what about the role of the Bible in contemporary society? The Bible Society of South Africa, we also distribute the Bible on cell phone. One available translation is the King James Bible and this year with the celebrations the downloads of the King James Bible is the most popular and many of these people are young people. And uh, we had well over 30,000 uh, 
in the, in the year 2010 downloaded onto cell phones, we sold over 30,000 print copies. And that's just through Bible societies, the other scripture agencies. Uh, so the King James Bible is, is still very much in demand today. And the King James Bible Trust in the UK that coordinated events around the world to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the book also launched a YouTube Bible initiative. It's an ambitious project to create a complete reading of the King James Bible on YouTube. Readers comprise of actors, sportsmen and women, musicians, politicians and people across the globe. They hope that as many people as possible from around the world will want to contribute and submit a chapter or two to the collection. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. This worldwide interest in the King James Bible says a lot about this unique book and how well loved it still is. Many, like Dirk Hierfus, continue to use the Bible in their private devotion as well. I appreciate the beauty of the King James language and to me it conveys the majesty of God and the holiness of this book and by that I mean otherness not just, uh, you know, in, that, in the true sense of the word holiness, in a, in a way that a lot of the, the modern translations don't. During the second half of the 20th century, there was a revolution in Bible translation, and literally hundreds of Bible translations in English have appeared. But will these new translations spell the demise of the King James Bible? By now we have new, we have the need to, to update and revise the language. It's no longer spoken, and it's reaching a point where it's no longer understood and the various uh, improvements come, improvements in the way of revisions. I think it will still be there as a part of the English church's history. It will still be read at solemn occasions and joyous occasions. Uh, it may still be a Bible that a, a president upon being inaugurated will perhaps read something from or put his hand on or her hand on as they are inaugurated into office and so forth. Uh, so it's, it's, for me, it's hard to imagine it disappearing completely. Um, even in this year of the 400th um, anniversary, we can't claim that it is used with the regularity that it, with which it used to be used, not at all. But it is still something that is not just a cultural artifact, it is still a part of the, 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 the kind of breathing of the of the english speaking church